All right, let's get started. Welcome back to Concrete Design. Um, a few things, so number one, I've got handouts uh, up here. If you haven't already grabbed some, go ahead and do that. I'm, I know some of you haven't because I still got, I think, three per person. There's one, uh, one a piece, so there's, I think, six of them. Don't, don't worry, these handouts will last you for probably the next three or four weeks, so you're doing, uh, you should be good for a while. A um, couple things, so uh, the Richard F. McCormick uh, Technical Conference is going on this month. It'll be on the, uh, the 26th. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, um, we have uh, resume booklets that we put on each table for the attendees in case some of the uh, uh, attendees are looking for uh, interns or maybe uh, are trying to hire uh, graduates. So uh, if you're interested, you should probably try and get your resume put together and sent to Noah Morgan. Uh, here's his uh, email address. S uh, do that by the 17th of January, uh, by the end of business, um, and uh, we'll have that ready for the conference. Also, it's probably a good idea if you've got the time to maybe consider being a volunteer for the conference. You know, you, it's a chance to rub elbows with somebody you might be working for. Uh, and, uh, so you can have some, so there's some significant networking opportunities there. Um, so contact Logan Stacks, he's the president of SAME ASC as soon as you can if you're interested in doing that. Uh, it's all day uh, Thursday, so um, uh, hopefully you can find some time to at the very least uh, attend. Um, but most of the volunteering efforts uh, take place really early, so it shouldn't conflict with, uh, conflict with your class schedule. Um, also, handouts if you haven't already grabbed them, one apiece. Um, uh, one other thing, I, I'm going to have some uh, classroom visits this semester, so I'm not really 100% sure when it'll happen, but here and there, uh, there might be some professors who come in and visit, so if one day you see like some liberal arts professor come sit in the back, don't freak out, they're, they're supposed to be here. I'm not 100% sure when they're coming, but um, just wanted to give you a heads up. I forgot to mention that uh, on Monday. Uh, don't forget homework one that's going to be assigned on Friday, uh, and then we'll go ahead and get into it. Uh, any questions? All right, so we're going to talk about uh, tributary area and gravity loads uh, today. I want to at least um, give you a brief uh, review of what we talked about last time. So last time, what we really talked about was, um, was really this. This was sort of our, our big topic for, for yesterday's discussion, which was really trying to address uncertainty in the uh, world of structural engineering. Now, we were trying to do that by managing the, uh, the probability of failure of a, of a given structure. You know, there are uncertainties associated not just with the resistance of a structure, you know, how strong it is. You know, there's uncertainties with material quality and fabrication tolerances and things like that. But there's also uncertainties associated with load. I mean, how sure are you that that snow load will be 20 pounds per square foot? How much confidence do you have in that uh, floor live load of 80 pounds per square foot? So um, we need to be able to address uncertainty uh, uh, in this field. Now, we do that by adjusting um, uh, not only the resistances, but the loads as well. And that's what we call our design philosophy, load and resistance factor design. We'll explore LRFD uh, throughout the semester, and you all will definitely become experts at, at, uh, at its implementation. But for now, I want to take it uh, one step at a time. The only thing I'll say is that for now, um, just to introduce you to some of the notation, um, when we talk about resistances, we'll start off by computing nominal resistances of a given element. So uh, a nominal resistance is basically how much load or how much force is required to literally fail the, the, the component. So if I've got a beam, how much load or how much moment do I need to apply to that beam before it fails? We then adjust that uh, resistance by a resistance factor, sort of a factor of safety associated just with the resistance. We call that phi. Uh, so phi Rn would be the design resistance. We then compare that against the factored load. So we have dead loads, live loads, snow loads, et cetera. And we have various factors and combinations that, that go along with those, uh, those different load components. The long and short of it is, um, the more uncertainty we have with a given load component, the higher its load factor. So a very common load combination we'll use is 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live. We have less certainty associated with live loads than we do dead loads, so we up our factor associated with the live. We say, okay, well, we've got to up the live load 60%, but we're a little more confident about the dead loads, so we only need to up that uh, 20%. <laughs> 
Um, and last, all we do is we compare the factored resistances to the factored loads. And as long as the factored resistances are larger than the factored loads, that means that the structure is safe and uh, everything's good. And that'll also form our basis for design. You know, if we've got some, uh, we know we're going to put a beam right here in the building and we know what loads it's going to be subjected to, how large does that beam need to be? How many rebar do we need to place uh, inside that, uh, that tension region in order to ensure that it has enough factored resistance to safely resist those loads? That's by and large how we do reinforced concrete design uh, and structural steel design and structural engineering design uh, in general. Before we start going down the rabbit hole uh, with design, we need to talk a little bit about the loads that the structures that we're designing are being subjected to. So uh, the first uh, sort of topic of discussion is tributary area. Now tributary area is, is used for all of our load events uh, in general, whether we're talking about dead loads, live loads, snow loads, etc. But we need to talk about exactly what that is. So tributary area is generally defined as the, uh, if we're talking about let's say a, a floor system and we're talking about floor beams, the tributary area for let's say a given floor beam is how much of that floor that particular beam is responsible for. And it's best defined by the area that's bounded by the lines halfway over to the next uh, adjacent element. And we use this for beams and columns and, uh, and what have you. So for instance, let's say I've got a given floor system. So again, we're, in, we're looking at uh, plan view, we're in the helicopter looking down. So these squares represent all of the columns, and we've got a series of beams uh, framing in to form the, uh, the floor system. Sound good? So if I look at you know, any particular floor beam, it doesn't really matter. Let's say I'm looking at let's say I'm looking at that floor beam, okay? And I want to determine what is the tributary area for that floor beam. That floor beam is going to be responsible for all the floor halfway over to the uh, next one adjacent and, and half one over. So, in other words, something about like that. This shaded region right here, that would be the tributary area for that floor beam. Because if I'm, you know, if I'm standing on this floor system and I'm somewhere in here, I'm counting on this floor beam to hold me up. Now, uh, on the other end, if I was standing, let's say, right there, well, that load would be distributed over to this floor beam. Does that make sense? All right. Everybody good on that? Now, another thing to keep in mind is the whole idea, you know, hip bone connected to the leg bone. Um, this floor beam is not being supported by the ground or something. It's actually framing in to these larger elements here that we're calling girders. So this floor beam is, pro is more than likely going to experience the load as a uniformly distributed uh, effect. But this floor beam is going to have support reactions that are then going to be transferred to the girders. Okay? So here's a, just a general example of that. So I, took this, I showed you all this last time. I took a picture of the 3rd Avenue parking garage uh, down the street because I wanted to try and you know, clearly explain what was going on with this concept of tributary area. So I have a series of uh, precast uh, T-shaped uh, beams that are being used to support the, the floor loading of this parking garage. The floor loading being the, the structure's self-weight and all the, the vehicles. Sound good? Now if I'm looking at, let's say, just a single rib of one of these, uh, these double T's, let's see how, how good I am at this. The tributary area for one of these T's might be something, I don't know, like that, and maybe kind of something like that. And then that T beam is going to be responsible for all that area, right? And then the next T over is going to be responsible for the next component, and so on and so forth, right? But then this T beam, think, you know, if this is a beam with a uniformly distributed load, it's framing into this larger girder right here, right? So this girder isn't going to be experiencing a, a, you know, like a, a distributed load. It's going to experience a large concentrated force, you know, right there, right? And then there's going to be another one right here and another one right here and another one right here, et cetera. Does that make sense? 
So it, as long as you think hip bone connected to the leg bone and you employ, you know, basic fundamental statics, your load takedown of the structure will always uh, add up in the end, okay? And we're going to go through a really, a really basic example uh, illustrating that, all right? <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to look at uh, the following example. We've got a floor system, and we're, we're just going to, the, the purpose of this example is just so you understand how the loads get distributed throughout the system. So we're going to um, uh, determine the load takedown on this system uh, due to a 20 pounds per square foot uh, load. Now I'm not stating that this is a dead load, live load, what have you. It's just, just 20 pounds per square foot. We'll deal with the separate load definitions uh, later. We're going to look at a typical interior beam, a typical girder, and a typical column. Okay? And then we're actually going to determine the loads on those elements uh, based on that 20 pounds per square foot uh, load. All right, sound good? Okay. All right, so here's the floor system. So let's take a look at some of the dimensions. So um, it, you know, if we were to assume up and down, let's just say this is north, you know, the bays along the numerical space, you know, from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 and 3 to 4, those are all 30-foot bays, and then the uh, distances from A to B and B to C and C to D, the uh, alphabetic ones, those are all 50-foot uh, bays. We've got uh, a series of floor beams that are uh, framing into these girders, and they're all spaced uh, 10 foot apart. All right, sound good? All right, so let's identify some tributary areas of some given elements. So first off, it was asking for what? A, uh, a typical floor beam, is that what it said? So there, one of the nice things about you know, designing for gravity loads is that once you know how to design a floor beam, you can design any floor beam. All right? So to give you kind of an idea uh, what I mean by that, let's just pick one. It, it doesn't really matter. Let's just pick, I don't know, this one. All right? So <coughs> let's see. So the tributary area for this floor beam is going to be halfway over to the next adjacent floor beam halfway over. So it's going to be a region that looks something about something about like that. Does that sound reasonable? Now, so think about like this. I, I want you to really sort of conceptualize this in your head. Goodness gracious, I'm a popular guy. I'll turn this down. All right. So I have a floor beam. Let's think about this ge uh, you know, geometrically. How long is this floor beam? 30 feet. Okay. Now, I want to also ask you, instead of talking about what its tributary area is, what's its tributary width? In other words, how wide is this right here? 10 feet. Okay. This is something to keep in mind. Now, that's this floor beam. Let's look at this floor beam. How long is it? What's its tributary width? 10 feet. So how is this floor beam any different than this one? If they're both being subjected to the same 20 pounds per square foot, they're both the same length and they both have the same tributary width, this beam is going to be the same as this one, right? So once you design a floor beam, you got them all designed, right? Now, which floor beams are going to be different? The outside ones, these ones right here, right? Because what's its tributary width? Half that. It's only going to be five feet, right? So you can use the same floor beam across the board other than these ones right here. I mean, if I took this beam and actually used it here, I would just be conservative, right? Which, which might be a good thing. Hold on. That might actually be a good thing because then I'm just doing the same beam over and over again. So from a fabrication and construction standpoint, it might be a little easier to just be a little conservative on your design and make the construction process a, a lot easier. Yes, sir? Let me, let me answer that twofold, okay? Um, there's a difference between, tribu there's a difference between tributary area, in other words, what I'm actually designing this beam for, 
and influence area. I mean, if I'm standing here, you know, I'd sit there and, you know, I'm standing here and there's a lot of force here, there's probably going to be some effect on this beam. But it's more about what do I need to design it for? You see what I'm saying? Using this approach, if I designed all of these floor beams, ultimately I would be designing a floor system that would encompass the entire load. Does that make sense? So there's a difference between what will actually influence it and what it's actually responsible for. Tributary area is defined as halfway over. Influence area is defined as all the way over. So the influence area for this beam would be all the way over. And we will look at that here in a second when we look at live load reduction, but we'll get to that. All right, you, then you. That is the point of this class. <laughs> um, uh, that's a loaded question, okay? And, and let, me, let me say this. Uh, let, me, let me sort of explore that a little bit, but I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. Okay, if that spacing gets wider and wider and wider, two things happen. Number one, we reduce the amount of floor beams in the system. Th think about it like this, okay? I've got, what, five spaces here, right, in this bay? So this is five spaces at 10 feet. I could do four spaces at 12 and a half feet, right? And that would, re that would eliminate a beam, right? But that would also increase the load on those beams. So those beams would then be a little heavier, a little deeper. D do you see what I mean? So it's a trade-off. You know, do I have a bunch of small beams or a few really big beams? And Sometimes it, it, it's not an easy question to answer because there's architectural requirements, there's the function of the building, there's a whole other avenue of stuff that needs to be considered. So we'll look at those aspects you know, throughout the semester, but does that kind of help answer your question? That's a good point to make, though. Yes, sir. And, and No, no, yeah. Th there are differences in these because they have floor beams framing into it. But, but not, I mean, this is just a regular floor beam. It's still, we're still going to take its effective span length to be, you know, 30 feet, and it's still going to have the same tributary width. The difference in areas and areas Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, yeah, it might come in a little bit, but just from a conservative, being conservative, just design them all the same. Do you have a question? You're exactly right, and that, that's another issue that needs to be considered. Um, I'd argue that in buildings, what you're talking about isn't really a big deal. Because, you know, take the, the, the Third Avenue parking garage. I mean, yeah, those are some pretty big elements, but each individual beam is only you know, a couple feet deep. It's not like a bridge where your elements really can get very large, and then you start broaching into, whoa, we've got to, you know, shallow this up a little bit so we can even truck it to the site. Does that make sense? That is, but I will say, that is an issue in general. Shipping an individual element and having issues with that is probably more of a bridge concern than a building concern. There is something to be said, though, about, well, if I eliminate, you know, I've got, what, five spaces between each bay. If I, you know, convert it to four spaces between each bay, I am uh, reducing the number of floor beams in the system altogether. And then there's, if I do that, then there's much less stuff I have to ship to the site. Does that make sense? No, that good? Anybody else? This is good stuff. Are we good? All right. So this is a particular floor beam. Let's talk about a girder. Which girder was selected? Which? C2, D2. So that's, we're talking about this one right here, right? Okay. Same story halfway over to the next adjacent element. So because this is a girder and it's got elements framing into it, its tributary area is probably going to look something about like this. Now, we're ultimately not going to use a tributary area aspect for this. We're just going to use sort of the hip bone connected to the leg bone type of thing. We're going to say, well, I've got floor beams framing into here, so I've got a support reaction from this floor beam and a support reaction from that floor beam and consider that uh, accordingly. But looking at it in, in 
you know, just a tributary uh, area aspect can give you uh, a general idea uh, as to the final design. Let me ask you this. Which elements do you think are going to be bigger in this building? The beams or the girders? Girders. Why? There, an easy way of saying it is the tributary area. It's so much bigger. There's so much more floor area that the girders are ultimately going to be responsible for, so they should be larger elements. Make sense? Not too bad, right? Now, what's the next one? There's a column. Which column was it? B2? B2? Okay, so that's this one. So columns are the same story, okay? Halfway over to the next adjacent column. So between B2 and A2, that's going to be somewhere about like that. Between B2 and B1, something about like that, something about like that, like that. So the tributary area for this column is actually going to look like this. Now columns actually offer a really nifty check. All right. We can look at columns from a tributary area aspect or we can look at columns from a framing aspect. How many floor beams are framing into that column? Floor beams, not girders, but floor beams. Two. How many girders are framing into it? Two, right? See, does everybody see that? So there's two girders, this girder and this girder are framing into it, and then there's this floor beam and this floor beam. You can treat it as if it's a tributary area problem, or you can hip bone connect it to the leg bone, if you will, and you'll get the same force. So, uh, and we'll, we'll explore that here in a second. All right, everybody okay with this? Okay, let's take each element one at a time. Okay, so let me pull up, uh, whoop. let's pull up the notebook and whoop. do a little bit of calcs. Let's start off with a floor beam, okay? All right. Now, <coughs> let me write down a couple values, and then we'll, um, we'll see how we can use that. Okay, so how long is the floor beam? 30 feet. Okay. Now, what is the tributary width? So, okay, 10 feet. So I'll say WT is the tributary width, just so we have it written down, and then I'm going to say it's 10 feet. Sound good? Now, what was the load that we were applying to the system? Bear with me. What was the load? 20 pounds per square foot. So let, bear with me. I'm going to try and test out my 3D art skills and see what I can do. All right, so we've got see that oh goodness all right okay so we've got a floor system right where each of these elements are spaced how far apart? How far apart are the floor beam spaced? 10 feet. So 10 feet. And this entire floor system is being subjected to a particular pressure load. So we've got a pressure load being applied you know, to the floor system. So something like this. And that's 20 pounds per square foot. Am I right? Okay. Now, what I'm doing in this analysis is I'm isolating a particular floor beam. Okay. So we're looking at this one. Okay. What I, it doesn't matter. We can look at that one or that one. I'm just pick this one. All right. So we're saying that this floor beam is responsible for halfway over here and halfway over here. Sound good? So. 
if I want, what I could say is, you know, that, <coughs> sorry, and that. So I'll move this. This is how much of that pressure load that that particular floor beam is responsible for, right? And we said that this width is also 10 feet, right? Sound good? Actually, that got a little sketchy. Bear with me. All right. So what I want to do is I want to say this. Well, if I have, think about it like this. If I have 20 pounds per square foot and it is applied over a width of 10 feet, couldn't that be turned into a, just a uniformly distributed load of what, 200 pounds per foot? Does that make sense? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this. If I'm just looking at that particular floor beam, I want to look at that particular floor beam with just a uniformly distributed load on it. Make sense? How much load that beam is responsible for. And that beam is just going to see it as a distributed load across the board. So that distributed load so I'm going to put that 20 pounds per square foot back. That distributed load is 10 feet times 20 PSF, which is 200 pounds per foot. Make sense? So if I'm looking at this particular floor beam, what I'm looking at is this. I'm looking at a floor beam. How long is that floor beam? 30 feet. And it is being subjected to a distributed load of 200 pounds per foot. Sound good? If you can't do that problem, I failed last semester. <laughs> Am I right? That's pretty basic, right? That's, that's not too complicated. All right? Now, I'm not going to make you do the entire analysis for this, uh, for this beam, but what I am going to do is this. Um, let me move this down a little bit because I'm going to have reactions, right? I'm going to call this the reaction of the beam. The reaction of the beam. They're going to be equal, right? They're going to be equal because it's the, you know, it's symmetric, the loading symmetric and the, and the geometry symmetric. So help me out. Does anybody know how much those reactions are going to be? Say it again. 3,000 pounds, because it's 200 pounds per foot for 30 feet, so that's 6,000 pounds total. Half on each end makes 3,000, right? So we'll say that RB, it, bless you, is one half 200 pounds per foot, 30 feet, which is 3,000 pounds, or three kips. Sound good? Everybody okay with that? Now, any questions? Okay. Now, I want to go back the, uh, real quick because I want to look at this. Okay? Remember, now what we're going to do is look at a girder. Okay? The girder is not experiencing the distributed load. It's experiencing the distributed reactions from those floor beams, right? So here, let's look at this girder real quick. So the girder is, how long is it? We're looking at what, C2, D2, right? 50 feet. And it's experiencing point loads how often? Every 10 feet. Okay, so, all right. Does everybody have what's going on here on this? Okay, all right.
Okay, so let's look at a girder. Oh, getting ahead of myself. C2, D2. All right, so our girder is going to look something about like this. And I'm going to have a point load about like that, about like that, about like that, about like that. That's not too bad, right? And each of those are going to be spaced how far apart? Ten feet. Ten feet, ten feet, ten feet, ten feet. Okay, so I'm also going to have reactions here as well. We'll call this RG. RG reactions of the girder. Now, tell me out, how much are those point loads going to be? Each point load. Mm. Six kips, right? Because, look at this. All right, go back to the floor system. All right. Here's the floor plan. At this point, how many floor beams are framing in? There's a floor beam here, and there's a floor beam here, right? So three kips is coming from this end, three kips is coming from this end, right? So it's not three kips at these particular points, it's six. Does that make sense? All right, so, so I'm going to put six kips, six kips, six kips, six kips. And I'll go ahead and put a note. 2RB is 6 kips. Now, that's for a girder that's in the middle of the structure. If it's one of those ones out on the ends, you know, on uh, line 1 or line 4, then it would only be 3 kips because in that instance, there's only one beam framing into it. Make sense? All right, help me out. Uh, what's RG going to be? 12,000 or 12 kips? Make sense? Not too bad, right? Any questions? Okay. Now the last thing we need to look at is a column. Now we're looking at column what, B2? Now watch this. We're going to do this column two different ways. Okay? So method number one. What is the tributary area of that column? Fifty by thirty, right? Because if I look at that column, so this distance here is twenty-five and twenty-five, so that's fifty, and this distance is fifteen and fifteen, so that's thirty. So that area is uh, fifty by thirty. So, whoop. so 50 feet, 30 feet, so that's what, 1,500? So, 1,500 squared times a pressure load, or 1,500 feet squared times a pressure load of 20 pounds per square foot. I mean, think about it, it's a column. So it should be experiencing a load in pounds or kips, right? So PSF times an area, that gives us pounds. So, so P, so I'll say PC, P for the column, is 20 pounds per square foot times 1,500 foot squared is, what, 30,000 pounds? 30 kips, right? Sound good? Yes, sir. So, um, you say girder, this column is more of a smooth question. Um, if the 12 kip reaction, so that would mean that whatever connecting two would have to resist it from 12 kip to two. Ex exactly. So, so, if you're dealing with a simple beam connection, so yes, this is a steel question, but um, if it's a simple beam connection, basically you're just saying, well, 
if the shear capacity of a bolt is two kips, you got 12 kips, you need six bolts. So basically, it's a little, it's much more involved than that, but that's the gist of it. Yes, sir. I'm getting to that, but you're exactly right because that because we are looking at just a floor. So if there's tw you know 20 floors in the building, then you're going to have that load every story. You're exactly right. But this is just a, from a a floor from a particular story. So if we're talking about a building, this might be the fourth floor, but there could be 12 floors in the building. Yes. Yes, yes. This floor beam will not experience load from the floor above it. Yes. That's a good question. Everybody else? All right. Now, let me go back to this real quick because this is method number one, just taking the pressure times the area. Another way is to look at the framing of it. All right. So method two. All right. Now, let me, let me show you this. Remind me of something. Um, what was the reaction of a floor beam, a single floor beam? Three kips. What was the reaction of a single floor girder? Twelve. So we had three for the floor beams, twelve for the girders. All right. How many floor beams are framing into a column? Two. How many girders? Two. So what I can do, I can say, all right, RB is 3 kips, RG is 12 kips, so the column load is 2 floor beams plus 2 floor girders, 2 3 kips plus 2 12 kips. So. Now you look, there's that, and there's that. So the statics works out, you know. Does that make sense? That's not too bad, right? But you can use this approach to do it. It's, this is what, what we're doing now. It's what's called a load takedown. You know, taking a given load component, you know, 20 pounds per square foot and then saying okay let's take this load component and then start distributing it to the floor beams the girders and then ultimately taking that load down to the foundation that's ultimately what we're trying to do does that make sense for you folks in steel uh, earlier when we talked about wind loads you basically do the same thing you take the wind pressure and then multiply it by the tributary area for that given side of the building and then there's a point load that can go on that brace or that moment frame. Same story. Any questions? Yes, sir. That's, a, that's an interesting question, um, and you, you do raise a good point. Um, it depends on the severity of the angle. Um, that also, let me say this, that become, the, the distribu distribution of that load becomes, I'd say, more complicated on snow loads on roofs. Because if you've got a roof like that, then you have to deal with projecting that load, you know, in the X and Y directions. Um, I'd argue that you could design a system like that, you know, pretty much just assuming the floor is flat and it's not going to be that big of a deal anyways. Because it's so long, you know. It's not like that. It's not like it's like this. I mean, it's such a graduated angle. So, And plus on that, that sloped in, it's actually a worst case scenario to just go ahead and lift that load up. Because then that column element is experiencing a larger force. So the only thing you have to do is ensure that your fabrication details make sense. So. Sound good? This is good stuff. Everybody good? All right. So now, okay. So I'm losing my stuff. Where my marker? Ah, there we go. Okay. So is everybody okay with taking a given pressure, you know, if I give you 20 PSF, 45 PSF, you could take that and distribute it across the system. And again, like you were saying, this is for a single story. So if you had, let's say, a 10-story building, then at each story, the column would experience 30 kits, 30 
60, 90, 120, and so on and so forth. So, you know, if you're talking about a column in a building that's sub being subjected to those gravity loads, the column is really big on the first story, but on the roof it doesn't really need to be as large because it's not experiencing as much compressive force. Does that make sense? Sound good? Okay. Now, what that what that example was intended to do was intended to ensure that given a pressure load, you could distribute it to the building. Now I, I want to at least talk about where you get those pressure loads from. I mentioned this in, in uh, steel design, I'll mention it in concrete as well. This is a document called ASCE 7. This is a very popular document uh, in the world of structural engineering because it outlines the minimum design loads for buildings uh, and other structures. Uh, live loads, snow loads, wind loads, you name it. And, you know, it, it sort of sets the standard for if you're designing a theater and you're designing a theater, you're designing them the same way, you know. I mean, what do you think is an appropriate PSF for a theater? You might think 100 PSF and you might think 120. I don't know that your engineering judgment is wrong in either case. But this is where they've gone and actually, you know, measured the, the loads in theaters and say, okay, here's the design load you need to be using. So you can have a little bit of assurance that the loads that you're using are correct. Make sense? Okay. Now, let's talk about dead loads. Dead loads are, prim are basically the self-weight of the structure itself. It's there. It's not going anywhere. Um, so if we're talking about this building, the, floor are the dead loads of a floor system, let's say we're looking at this floor system, are everything from the slab and the, the beams themselves to the HVAC, the mechanical duct allowances, the drop ceiling, the uh, electric, you know, the, the, the fluorescent lights and all the electric that goes into it. Everything that is basically stationary and comprised of the structure itself. Okay? Does that make sense? The stuff that isn't going anywhere. Um, there are two densities that by the time you're done with uh, steel design and concrete design, I want drilled into your head. And that is uh, how much steel weight, I say densities, it's really unit weights, how much steel weighs and how much reinforced concrete weighs. Structural steel weighs 490 pounds per cubic foot. That's a, a, a token value you're going to want to uh, take down. Now, this unit weight of reinforced concrete is a reasonable upper bound estimate. You know, uh, if you've had civil engineering materials, you know that concrete properties vary. Typical normal weight concrete weighs around 140 to 145 pounds per cubic foot, but we throw reinforcement into that, that, uh, that concrete. We have rebar and slabs and beams and things like that. And since steel is heavier, um, we up that unit weight a little bit to account for the reinforcement. We're not taking down every single rebar and a beam and, and adding that to the unit weight. So we just say eh, 150 pounds per cubic foot, that's a reasonable value for, uh, for reinforced concrete. So this is a value we are going to use quite a bit. This one over here on the right. So that's one you're going to want to drill into the memory banks and have on all your, your formula sheets and whatnot. Sound good? Okay, so here's some, speaking of uh, uh, PSFs, here's some particular floor dead loads and roof dead loads that will give you kind of an idea of where some of these values come, in from, uh, come from. And this stuff can come from ASCE 7 or manufacturers. For instance, you know, if, if you're a structural engineer and you're designing a building and the architect says you're going to use this particular type of drop ceiling, call the manufacturer. They should be able to tell you how much it weighs, you know, how many pounds per square foot for this particular element. But it, also, if, you know, if you don't have that information, that's where ASC 7 comes into play. So, for instance, for common floor dead loads, you know, fireproofing usually weighs about two pounds per square foot. Metal deck is, uh, it depends on the thickness, you know, if it's a uh, uh, 9 16 inch deck, you know, one pounds per square foot. Floor finishes, you know, if we're using ceramic tile, that's 10 pounds per square foot. Mechanical and electrical allowance is anywhere from 5 to 10 pounds per square foot. Suspended ceiling, 2 pounds per square foot. So it gives you an idea of how much these particular elements weigh. And it just depends on the type of system that you're designing, right? Sound good? Isn't too bad, right? Um, there's also different, usually different uh, loads associated with the roof. I mean, a lot of times on roofs you might have like a, a neoprene uh, sheet, maybe some gravel and things like that, so that's going to have a different weight attached to it. Yes, sir?
That's a, that's a good question. And the, does the factor of safety account for future renovations to a building? No, it doesn't. Um, let, let's put it like this. Let, let me answer your question in this fashion. So this building, it was designed to be primary, primarily classrooms, computer labs, things like that. Okay. If 20 years down the line and the engineering college at Marshall has four or five buildings you know, in Huntington, and we take a look at this building and we say, ah, let's turn it into a library. Well, you can't just go into these rooms and start putting in book stacks, and, and here's why. Classroom floor loads are typically around 40 pounds per square foot, something like that. But libraries are around 150 pounds per square foot. Now, why do libraries have much larger loadings than, than classrooms? Because the books. All right. And there's a lot of other issues associated with that. You can't just go in and say, oh, it'll be fine. If you do something like that, some substantial renovation like that, you need to have a structural engineer come in and say, sure, go ahead, it'll be fine, or nope, you need to reconstruct that floor system. The, the, the load factors that we use will not take into account changes in the use of the building, you know, if it turns into a different structure altogether. It does take into account, though, you know, I've got here a listing of two pounds per square foot for this suspended ceiling. Maybe it's not two pounds per square foot. Maybe it's 2.1. Maybe it's 2.2. You know, little variations in the estimates for these loads. It will take that into account. Is that, is that good? Yes, sir. As long as their wallet is dead set along with it. <laughs> I mean, they'd, they'd have to do some reconstruction of the, of the structure. It just depends. I mean, <laughs> no, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, if you're, you're dead set uh, against that, then, or you're dead set to do that, then you have to be willing to spend the money. Um, uh, my wife has a, has, has a friend who uh, they were thinking of doing some substantial renovations to their house, and they were basically wanting to replace the entire second story. And they knew that, that I was a structural engineer, and they said, so what do you think if we wanted to replace the entire second story? I said, well, first off, you need to contact, you know, a licensed engineer, home inspector, all this to do that. But I said, if you really want to do this, my advice would be to contact a good real estate agent and consider getting another house, because the amount of money that you're going to spend is going to be ridiculous. But, you know, I said, you need to contact somebody and whatnot. But it's money. You just have to spend spend a fair amount of money to redesign the floor systems. It just, just depends. So um, all right. Any, any other questions? I do want to go over a very basic calculation with you. And then or Friday, we'll talk about live loads and snow and things like that. So one of the most fundamental loads that we will compute throughout this course is a beam's self-weight, you know? All beams must be able to resist their own self-weight, okay? Now, we typically idealize self-weights as a uniformly distributed load, but I want to explain how we calculate that. We ultimately take the unit weight and multiply it by the area, okay? And I know and every time I do this, the first time the students see it, they go, why do you do that to get the unit weight? It's really not that complicated when you break it down. Let's say I have a beam that is B wide, H tall, and L long, right? Now, how would I calculate the total weight of that beam? Now, how much force I have to apply to lift that beam up? Well, it's the unit weight, you know, 150 pounds per cubic foot times the volume, width times height times length, right? But what I want is not the weight of the beam. I want the weight per foot the weight per its unit length, right? So if, if this beam weighs 2,000 pounds and it's 10 feet long, that's 200 pounds per foot, right? Now, how did I do that calculation? I took the weight and I divided it by the length, right? So if I take the weight and I divide it by the length, well, I'm taking this and dividing it by the length, so it's gamma BH. Well, what's BH? That's the area, right? So later on, when I say, oh, what's the, what's the self-weight of the beam? Oh, it's just a gamma times the area. N now you understand where, where I came up with that. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Like you said, uh, it could be one, like, uh, one inch to one inch. 
Well, kind of. That, that is going to be if, um, that's just trying to determine how much of the floor that beam is responsible for. What I'm talking about is just the beam by itself has a weight. It, it, it has to be able to support that load as well. And that's how we would compute that. Does that make sense? Everybody else good? All right. Live loads and snow loads on Friday. We'll see you. Y'all have a good rest of your week until I see you.